story. There was, there was this man who had been lost in the desert, been wandering around for about four or five days. He had run out of water, out of food. It was hot. He was tired. He was weak. And all of a sudden, he comes to the edge of the desert, and he looks out, and there's a house. And so he begins to go to that house, and he realizes once he arrives at that house, and he crawls upon the porch and knocks on the door, and, and a preacher comes to the door. And so the preacher helped him up and, and took him into his home and nourished him and took care of him kind of nurtured him back to health, gave him water and food. And after about a week or so, the man says, I'm feeling pretty good. He said, I'm, I really need to go to the nearest town if you would point me in that direction. And the preacher said, well, he said, the nearest town's about 20 miles away and, and it's a long walk and it's hot outside. He said, if you'd like, I'd loan you my horse. And so the little boy, you know, he's, he's a pretty good cowboy. He says, oh yeah, that'll work. I can, you know, I can get to town faster. So the preacher saddles up the horse, gets him ready, gets him on the horse, and then he says, by the way, I need to tell you something about this horse. He said, in order for this horse to go, he said, I trained him this way. He says, you have to say, thank God. The horse won't go for nothing else. And he said, when you want him to stop, you have to say, amen. So the old boy says, okay, I get, that sounds easy enough. I, he gets on the horse, he starts out, you know, he says, thank God. Now, sure enough, the horse just walks away. Going on down the road about a mile or two, and he thinks, Thank God! And the horse got up to a gallop. So he said, Man, thank God, thank God, thank God! The horse took off. I mean, just at a dead run, as hard as it could go. The guy looks up, and there's a cliff coming up. I mean, it's coming fast, just off about 200 feet into the gulf. He starts hollering, whoa, hold it, stop. Then he finally remembers, amen. And the horse just throws on the brakes and stops. Right at the edge of the cliff. Guy raised up in the saddle, left off little gravels dropping down on the rocks. As he says, thank God. <laughs> Over the cliff he goes. <laughs> Sometimes we don't think things through before we do them, do we? Luke chapter 17. Then said he unto his disciples, It is impossible by the, but that offenses will come. But woe unto them through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, <laughs> saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive me. Notice the, notice the apostle's response. Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the seed, and it should obey thee. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, 
will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to me. <coughs> and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup. Gird thyself, serve me, till I have eaten and drunk. And afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he think that that servant, because he did the things that were commanded of him, I throw not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded of you, say, ye are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Our Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you that we have the Word of God that can guide us and lead us and direct us. And I pray, O oh God, as we look into your Word this morning, that you would have your way in every heart and in every life. I pray that you would reveal to us the direction you would have us to go. I pray that you would put your hand upon this church and its people and use us to glorify your Son to bring in a lost and a dying world before it's eternally too late. And we will praise you and honor you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. <coughs> if I were to have a thought this morning, for this message it would be this. <coughs> Sir, a heart condition. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, I am separated under the gospel of God, called to be a servant. How many of you know that's your position as well? You are called to be a servant. Once Paul realized that he was called to be a servant, Every ambition in his life was nipped in the bud. Every desire of Paul's life. How many of you know Paul was a very educated man? Yes. He had some goals. He had some dreams. He had some plans on being part of the hierarchy of the Jewish religion. All that desire that was in his life was quenched. Every outlook, every thing that he had planned for in the future completely extinguished and blotted out when he said this statement, I am separated unto the gospel of God. You see, the problem that we have today, there are several things about servitude in the word of God, but it has to be a heart condition. If I'm going to serve God, I cannot make up my mind that I'm going to serve God and accomplish that task. How many of you, there's too many issues, too many problems? How many of you know there's too many people like that that will deny you, lie about you, stab you in the back, amen, for you to get over this in the flesh? <coughs> but the problem today that I foresee, even in the modern church with God's people, being servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, they are proud to claim to be Christians. They are proud that the Lord is coming back and get them someday. But to claim servitude, to claim that they are a servant of the Most High God, they run into issues with that. How many of you know this is a very prideful nation? We are a very prideful people. See, the problem that we have in modern day America is we don't like to be servants. We don't like serving other people. We want to be served. But we don't like others. How many of you know a lot of people will go to restaurants? Now, I have experienced over the years that most people who work in restaurants, waitresses in particular, if you study it, a large majority of them turn out to be single moms who don't have a great lot of education, 
They are doing the best they can. They are struggling to get by. They've got little kids at home that they need to be with, but they're having to work to provide for those kids. They may be going through a rough day, but we go in to sit down to eat, and we're all about ourselves, and we want that woman to serve us, and if she don't serve us in a particular way that we like, we won't even give her a tip. Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. We like to be served. We don't like the idea of serving others. See, we don't even like being under authority in America. How many of you know that? I want to be in charge. It's all about me. But you know what Jesus taught throughout the Word of God? Servitude. You see, being a servant is a heart condition. We want position, we want power, or we want some combination of those two things. Did you know executives in large corporations over the years have made a fantastic discovery? You can take people that coming in on the bottom rung of the ladder, on the entry level jobs in the corporation, they found out that some of those people, you can move them up through the corporation by simply giving them another title, and you don't even have to give them a raise. Just make them think they're in charge of something. And they go after it. How many of you know it's a natural phenomenon for us to be that way? But back up with me to the book of Mark. I want to show you something. It's not new. It's not something that just came up last week. Mark chapter 10, you'll find a very interesting scripture here. And it involves James and John. Anybody know who James and John are? They are two of the Lord's disciples. Now you've got to get this picture and understand this, but Jesus' ministry only lasted three years. So this was sometimes within a 36-month period that this scripture happens. <coughs> Look at it. Mark chapter 10 and verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we desire. And another scripture in another one of the gospels says they came by night. I'm not surprised. Then they came by now. And he said unto them, what, will, what would you that I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, in thy glory. Authority. Position. Power. It didn't just start in modern America. It started back with the disciples. They wanted it too. Amen. Amen. 38. The Bible said, But Jesus said unto them, You know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? You see, it's not that they understood what they wanted. They just knew in their heart that they wanted authority. If you study that, you'll find one place where their mother went to Jesus and asked for the same thing. See, if we can't get it ourselves, we'll employ somebody else or implore somebody else to go ask for it. See if you can help me. You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. We can get into this thing. See, these disciples did not understand servitude. They did not understand having a servant's heart. They did not understand that being a servant was a heart condition until after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hate to say this, but it's true. A lot of people go to church for 30 years and they never understand being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one thing we must keep in mind is that you and I are the tools. We're not the carpenter. Amen. You understand what I'm saying to you? If we present ourselves as servants to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the master builder, he can use us. But we're not the carpenter. It's not up to us to design what God wants or to form what God wants. It's simply to be available and obedient to whatever the Lord wants us 
to do. Being a servant is all about building God's kingdom, not mine. Amen? The word servant appears 980 times in the King James Version of the Bible. And most every place that it appears, especially in the New Testament, it can be translated out of its original language, bond servant. How many of you know what a bond servant is? <laughs> Bond servant means a servant for life by choice. I said a servant for life by choice. You see, servitude or being a servant or having a servant's heart is a heart condition. It must first be a decision that I make. I must decide that I choose to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I choose to yield to his leading, to his guiding, to his direction as to what I want to do. It's not my option. It's not my plan. It's God's plan. That's where Paul was. When he came to the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul came to the conclusion that everything that he was, every, all the education that he had, every ability that he had, the superiority of knowledge that he had was worth nothing unless he submitted himself and all that he was or all that he ever hoped to be to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember on the road to Damascus when God struck Paul down on the road, he asked, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecute. Paul was an educated man. He knew the Jewish law. He was raised in it from a child. He was taught in it. He sat under the feet of the best teachers. Yet Jesus said, you're persecuting me. A lot of times we take it upon ourselves to do things or go particular directions without the guidance, without the leadership, without the direction of the Holy Spirit of God, we get into trouble with those things and then we do not understand why we're in trouble. But the simple fact is, we should do nothing without the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, there are many examples in Scripture. I mean, you can go through the Scriptures and and you can think of Daniel and the three Hebrew children and all others. I'm thinking of Abraham. See, a servant must be committed to do what his master says, no matter what that is. Abraham was good with God, making him the father of many nations. Abraham was good with God giving him a son in his old age. Abraham was good with everything that God did. But yet one day God come to Abraham and he said, Abraham, I want you to take your son and I want you to take some wood and I want you to go to a particular place I'm going to show you and I want you to build an altar and I want you to put your son on it and I want you to sacrifice. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Abraham was willing to do that. We know by the word of God that Abraham took his son and he took fire and he took wood and he made the altar and put his son on the altar and raised the knife to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. See, this is not just about serving God at our convenience. It's not just about serving God as long as it pleases us or brings us in the direction that we want it to bring us in. It's serving God. When God says, take your son, put him on an altar and sacrifice him to me. God says, you have all this stuff. Send it all and do what I tell you to do. See, Abraham left his family, his home. <coughs> Being a servant is a choice that means you make a choice to serve for a lifetime. And it's a free choice. 
I know a lot of people that serve God as long as it's convenient. But if it's not convenient, they got something else to do, they're gone. How many of you know that's true? I think about Moses who killed an Egyptian, fled Egypt, went to the backside of the desert and became a shepherd. All that was convenient for him. But there come a day when Moses was out on the backside of the desert and he saw a bush burning and it wasn't consumed and he went over to it and God spoke to him out of that bush and said, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt where there's a price on your head, where you're wanted for murder and I want you to go down there and deliver my children. And Moses says, wait a minute. <coughs> I'm willing to serve you here on the back side of the desert. I'm sure at that time God says, but I don't have any body to you for you to serve out here. But ultimately Moses went back and we know the account of what happened. That through a man's obedience and servitude, God delivered a nation from bondage and poverty and slavery. Because of one man's obedience, you see, servitude is a heart condition. Paul had a position of power, but he gave it up to be a bondservant for the Lord Jesus Christ. Servant, <coughs> it's a heart condition. It has to start down here. It can't start here because if it starts here, the first time you run into resistance, you're going to back up. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul says, What? Know ye not that you are, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. But then he goes on into verse 20, and he says this, that's 1 Corinthians 19, 19 and 20. Or 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, I'm sorry. In verse 20 he says this, you're bought with a price. You're not your own. How many of you know that the Lord paid a high price for you? Amen. He paid the price of His only begotten Son dying on the cross of Calvary <coughs> that you and I might have the privilege and the honor to come to Him and accept His sacrifice. And we are bought with a price. I was amazed when I read the scripture that I read to you this morning in the book of Luke because I read the entire thing and the one thing that stuck out to me was found in verse 10 where Jesus told his disciples, So likewise ye when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you say, Isn't this amazing? We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. You see, serving the Lord Jesus Christ is not just a matter of getting saved and coming to church on Sunday morning and shouting at the music and dancing and enjoying life and then going about our way the next six days till next Sunday and do it again. We have a duty we're not our own. We've been bought with a price, a great price. And there are some responsibilities in that, and one of them is servitude. And servitude is when you become a willing and obedient servant to God Almighty and God's Word by choice. Mm -hmm. Now I must tell you this morning that there are people out there you know, I've come to a great conclusion over the last few weeks. I've been studying what's going on in America. And one of the things I found out is you can't listen to the secular media. The, the, our, they'll lie to you. Yeah. You ever figured that out? Yeah. You want to know how to get the real truth? Listen to the foreign media. They'll tell you the truth. 
Our media today, our news media is so manipulated that they tell you what they want you to hear and they tell you bits and pieces calculated on what they think your reaction is going to be. Come on now. I'm telling you, there are people out there who are ignorant of the Word of God. And I think, and I'm convinced, and, and I'm becoming more convinced every day that there's two big problems in the United States of America. One of them is ignorance of what's going on, and the other is apathy. You say, preacher, I don't understand what that means. Maybe I can say it like this. You ask somebody if they know and understand what's happening in the world today, and you know what the response is? I don't know, <laughs> ignorance, and I don't care, apathy. You get that response more often than, I don't know, I don't care. You see, we have, <laughs> we are to the point in this country where we have come down to, if it don't affect me personally, at this moment in time, it doesn't matter with me. That's where we are. <laughs> But there are people out there who are ignorant of what the Word of God says. I mean, I'm talking about people that are in church who do not understand the Scriptures. They do not understand what God requires. They do not understand what God is asking. They're ignorant of God's purpose. They're ignorant of God's promises. And they're also ignorant of God's power. If some people that I have seen lately knew what kind of authority and power God really had, they would be a little more careful about standing up and shaking their fist in his face. Right. I'm telling you, folk, I read this week that we are about to enter a nuclear peace treaty with Iran. Did anybody else know that? In this treaty, from what I understand, I haven't read all of it, just bits and pieces, some of the demands for Iran were we have to give them a certain amount of money. Millions. We have to agree not to put any trade embargoes on them. We have to agree to buy certain amounts of the product manufactured in Iran. And we get out of it from them a promise that they will stop making nuclear weapons. <laughs> My reaction exactly to, yeah, right. <laughs> it sounds like a one-sided treaty to me, but my Bible said, when they say peace and safety, Lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. When they pay, see, say peace and safety, sudden destruction is coming. But if you're ignorant of what the Word of God says, you won't know that stuff, so therefore you won't obey. If there was ever a time when God's people need, need desperately need, to get into an attitude of servitude, it's right now. But those people who are out there who are ignorant of God's promises and God's word and God's power, they will not agree with you on what a biblical description of a servant is. But you know what this Bible says? Jesus said that he says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many of you know that being a servant under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ is the safest place in this world right now? Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I'd rather be a servant of the Most High God than hold the office of President of the United States. That's a bad spot to be in. Amen. Amen. So what I have come to the conclusion of is that you and I as God's people have a duty. And that duty begins with a heart condition called servitude. It's our responsibility not to worry about the world, not to worry about the things of the world, and actually not even to worry 
and concern ourselves when our own brothers and sisters in Christ offend us or say hurtful things because Jesus said right before he said, you've got a duty, he said, if your brother offends you seven times and come back and repent, forgive him. You see, that's where we have a problem, forgiving people. I'll forgive you, but I ain't never going to forgive you. <coughs> I had that trouble in years past with some people. But you know what I've discovered, folk? The decision to become a servant, totally committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, by choice, determines the difference in whether you have a relationship with Jesus Christ or you have a situationship with Jesus Christ. How many of you know most of us have got situationships? As long as we like our situation, we'll worship the Lord. When our situation changes, our attitude toward God changes. Huh? Come on. The question we have to answer for ourselves today is are we in relationship with God or are we in a situationship with God? <coughs> On Thursday, this church and its people, by gracious consent, have chosen to become servants. Now I have to tell you, it would be more convenient for us to stay at home and enjoy Thanksgiving dinner with family and friends and just relax and take the day off. But we have chosen to become servants. I predict, <coughs> I prophesy that this Thursday, you that serve here at this church are going to see some people that you're probably not going to agree with. They may not be dressed the way you think they ought to be. They not, may not look the way you think they ought to look. They might not even smell the way you think they ought to smell. But here's the thing. That's not for a servant to judge. Because God loved them just as much as he loved me and he loved you. Being a servant is not about choosing the circumstances we serve in. Not being able to opt out if we don't like the situation. Being a servant is choosing to serve God and walking in obedience to him by choice. There are people out there that will lie on you. They'll cheat on you. They'll, they'll do dirty things to you. You know what? That doesn't change your position. I'm serving you. If you choose to be a servant, that changes nothing. You think about this. The Lord Jesus Christ himself was persecuted, was spit upon, was mocked. Back up again to the book of Mark. I think I want to just share one verse of scripture that just came to me, and I think it's in Mark. Mark chapter 10. This scripture just came to me. Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. Listen to what it says. This is right after Jesus told James and John who had come to him to request authority and position. Verse 45. Let's go to verse 44. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of you. How many? Listen to the next verse, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. If my Lord came to be a servant, why in the world would I even begin to think 
then I should be better than him. If he came to be a servant, then my duty is servitude. Serving when I don't want to serve. Going where I don't want to go. <coughs> Doing what I don't want to do simply because the Lord requires it of me. I read this week, one of the things that I've learned <coughs> over the last few years is that if you can't trust your local media and the American media, who do you trust? And I have learned and subscribed to several news organizations, some outside this country that produce the news, but some Christian organizations that produce the news. And one of them is called BCN, which is Breaking Christian News. And anytime there's something happening in the news that affects the church, I get emails with those articles in them. On this past week, I got an article from BCN. And the article was in reference to a pastor in Rome, Georgia, 42 years old, with a church membership of 800 people. On Sunday morning, while the church was waiting for him to come and preach, he didn't come. They got concerned and they began to go look for him. His wife went home, which was the first place anybody should have looked. And there sitting in his car in his driveway, she found his body. 42 years old, pastor of an 800 member church, had taken his own life. <laughs> My automatic reaction was, why would this happen? <coughs> so I read the article and I began to understand that he had been under a doctor's care recently for depression. How many of you know depression is a damnable thing? Yeah. And it will cause you to kill yourself or kill you. But here are some of the things they let out. Number one. He didn't feel like he was making any difference. He didn't feel like God was speaking to him and he wasn't hearing from God. He didn't feel like the world really cared what he had to say. He couldn't understand. Now this man had 800 people in his church. Yet he took the gun and blew his brains out because he didn't think he was making a difference. But I suspect after reading that article, the entire article, I think the one thing that was missing in his life, because of some of the things that were said in the article, I think the one thing that was missing is that man did not understand that he was simply a servant. I think he thought he had to do it himself. I think he thought it was his responsibility to make sure everything at church was running right. I think he thought that it was his job to see that everybody stayed the line and everybody stayed on course. That's not my job, folks. It wasn't his job. You know what his job was? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke with all long suffering. But somehow he got the idea that all these little things were his job. And the distraction came. He did not understand that servitude is a hard attitude. <coughs> and it became overwhelming to him. And I'm here to tell you this morning that if you try to serve God within yourself, it will overwhelm you. Amen. You will quit sooner or later. <coughs> you will back out of it because your mind will tell you it ain't working. It ain't working. It ain't going right. But I'm here to tell you, church, if we understand where we are, if we understand whose we are, if we understand where we're going, and we understand what our duty is, our duty is simply proclaiming the gospel.
to a lost and dying world. I want to tell you this, and then we're going to have a communion this morning. This is a good day for you. You hear me? This is Father the Son, Father the Daughter type stuff. You can't win everybody. I said you cannot win everybody. Sometimes you have to choose to earn who you're going to and let the rest of it go. You cannot do it all, but you can do something. You can do what God asks you to do. You can do what God leads you to do. And if you will simply do that, that it's your duty to do, God will take care of it. Amen. You see, we plant the seeds. We water. But God gives the increase. Without Him, we're not. Amen. Serve. It's a heart attitude. It has to come from you. It has to come because you love, number one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, you love other people. You're not capable of that kind of love. I'm here to tell you right now, I'm not. But if we will let God love through us, the people that come in here on Thursday, don't care what they smell like, what they look like, what they say, <laughs> I assure you, and I, I've already thought this through, prayed about it. Somebody in our church is going to be offended because somebody that comes in here is going to curse in our church. Oh, they don't know the Lord you know. Love them. Minister to them. Help them to see what you see. Help them to understand what you understand. See, we get so <laughs> about things we can't do anything about. Let it go. Come here Thursday with an attitude of servitude. Let's serve whoever God sends here. Be a witness to them and win some of them to the Lord. You ain't going to win them all, but you might win some. All right? There's nothing else planted seeds. Amen. Amen. Let God do the watering and the increase that go. I heard Dr. David Jeremiah <coughs> the other night. <coughs> Jim Baker was told me. And they were talking to, you know, about the things of the Lord and the end times and all this sort of thing. And Dr. Jeremiah made this statement. He said, if if the church would simply do what they know to do. to do. We'd have the greatest revival you've ever seen. <laughs> and I've thought about that since I heard that said, you know. And that, that's the truth. If we would just simply do what we know to do. Well, if do we do it or not, but if we, you know, if we did it, it would absolutely cause a revival to yes. break out worldwide. I want to tell you something, church, and I want to just share this. Uh, Sister Nelly, you need to come, friend. I want you to serve. Uh, Glenn, I want you to serve. <coughs> Back in the 1700s, when this nation was young, we had an issue in this nation. How many of you know about slavery? Okay. We had a civil war. That civil war divided families. It divided fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, because there was two sides in that civil war. One was against slavery and wanted to liberate the slaves. The other side was for slavery and wanted to keep the people slaves. This nation fought a civil war over that. And one side won and one side lost. How many of you know that? 
I submit to you as a church that the United States of America is in a civil war right now. Just as serious, just as bad, it is separating families, mamas and daddies and, and children. And here are the combatants. On the one side are those people who believe that the Bible is the Word of God. They believe in the principles taught in the Word of God. They're called Christians. On the other side is the secular humanists who are trying to take the Word of God out of the American lifestyle. The war is on. And one side is going to win, and one side is going to lose. I'll leave you something to think about. Are we on the winning side? Only if we choose to win. We have to wage the war. Because if you think the human secularists are not waging the war, you haven't looked at the news lately. It's out there, folks. This nation is in a fight for its life. And one side's going to win, and the other side's going to lose. Stand here.